We'll start today with IREC. So Tyler is gonna give an overview of what Flight Dynamics or Payload. Drift Control has been up to. Can you guys hear me? Good. Yes. Yeah. All right. So yeah, big change with the Drift Control. Um, we were originally in that bay in the center, which is like a 14 inch long bay. Um, we're actually switching avionics to there and moving drift into a smaller bay out in the airframe. And I'll get in more as to how that's happening. Uh, next slide. So this little bay on the right is kind of a general design of what we're going for. Um, three to four inch diameter, probably leaning more towards four inch. Um, so it won't be attached to the airframe at all. It'll actually be attached to the shock cord by that eye bolt at the bottom. And then we will have electronics housed inside and the motor and the steering up top outside the tube. And feel free to jump in any time if you guys have questions. You can go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. The big reasons for these changes are these three. Um, the biggest one I think was rocket spin. Uh, when we hit Apogee, the rocket will probably be spinning wildly. Um, with our parachute deployed, um, that would probably kill its structural stability completely. And it would be, it would not actually come down properly. Um, so we're going to attach a swivel between that bottom eye bolt and the shock cord. That way the entire rocket should be able to spin independently of this bay. So that should solve that problem. Um, another thing we were worried about when we had the um, parachute coming out from the top of the bulkhead, and that was the original design out of like that center bay, we would have also had a shock cord attaching to the same bulkhead. And that was a big concern because if those wrapped around each other at all, that would also keep our parachute from deploying. And then third, we would have had um, shroud lines to steer the parachute going down through that top bulkhead, which would have also meant pressure from the ejection charges could get in that bay and potentially destroy our electronics. So now we'll be able to seal that up properly because the steering mechanism is completely outside of the electronics bay. So here's kind of a basic design for the steering mechanism and mount. Um, the load on the bay should equal the drag force, or yeah, the drag force from the drogue, which is the rocket's weight, around 50 pounds. Most of that weight should be on the fixed lines. So basically, we'll have a big collection of shroud lines from the parachute that we have to attach. Um, all but two will be fixed lines, so we won't steer with them, and the two on the edge will be the steering lines. So hopefully there shouldn't actually be a lot of force on the steering mechanism and it should mostly be on that bracket. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, I've actually slotted that, it's like a T bracket, and it slots up through the bottom of the forward bulkhead so that that force is mostly on the bulkhead and larger fasteners like the threaded rods instead of however we mount the bracket. And then this is the chute we're using. So you can kind of see those shroud lines there. Um, yeah, there'll be a single keel, relatively simple design. I actually just got the nylon to build a prototype today, so we can start that hopefully next week if we're in lab. Um, the big thing I want to see is like the load distribution of this, how much force will be on those steering lines versus the fixed lines, stuff like that. But we kind of just need a prototype because it's really hard to get any information. Um, it's pretty much all done experimentally for shoots like these, so we'll kind of have to get our own numbers through testing. Yeah, and then the last thing I had was, here's the electronics, a little more in detail. Um, we'll be using a big red B GPS, both because we have to track our rocket for IREC, and that'll provide data to the drift control system, um, a nine degree of freedom IMU to give us our acceleration, angular velocity, and orientation. So that'll definitely help figure out exactly where we're going, because the GPS will probably only be like a one hertz update rate. And that'll just be location and altitude. It'll kind of be hard to tell where we're going if that's the only information we have. And then we will run that all through an Arduino and then to the servo, which should be a decent but not crazy high torque servo. So that was all I had. If anyone has questions on any of that or concerns. Yeah. I got a quick question. Um, yeah. 
I was a, um, I was like the entire uh, drip control thing st stored in the rocket. Is it just free to move around, or is it? Yeah, it'll be mostly free. We're gonna pack it real tight with dog barf. Oh, okay. Sure that, that, yeah, that really especially around the motor and stuff to make sure that that's okay. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Yep. If you don't mind. Um, so, uh, like, would your servo motors be able to uh, operate on nine volts, considering the high torque they may be facing? It will I be able to operate on nine volts. Uh -huh. um, I'm not exactly sure of the power requirements because we haven't even picked a motor yet for sure. So, I mean, that, yeah, we can definitely change the batteries if we need to. But yeah, that's a good point. It might not be. That enough. makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So one of our main concerns right now is what type of servo we need, because we're not sure what required torque we need, because we're not sure what um, the load on those steering lines will be. Uh, like Tyler said, it's very hard to do a simulation of it, because it, you can't do like a SolidWorks of it, because it's a fluid surface. It moves. Um, so yeah, we'd have to, we're trying to come up with some sort of testing plan as to how we're going to be testing the load on those steering lines. And that'll help us pick our server. That makes sense. Okay, so if there's no more questions, we'll move on to uh, what NASA SL is doing. So Matthew's going to talk about flight dynamics. Yep, can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. All right, so hi guys. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the updates we've made related to flight dynamics. So I'm going to present to you just a, sort of a general overview, a lot of the conceptual changes. And then one of my sub team members, Christian, he's gonna talk to you a little bit more about the numbers and the, the target values that we're, we're at right now. So one of the major changes that we made is that the rocket now has four independent sections. So that doesn't include the payload. You may remember a little while back, we got a clarification from NASA regarding whether the payload does or doesn't count as an independent section. And it doesn't, so that enabled us to have a different, a separate section on the rocket. So we're basically taking advantage of that to have um, sort of a payload bay that the payload deploys from, and then sort of a central section, which is where the, the main deploys from. And then, an, and then the aft section of the rocket is where the drogue deploys from. And then the fourth um, subsection is just the nose cone up at the front. So that, that separates so that the uh, payload can come out. So that's sort of a, a change in the sort of organization of the rocket itself. Uh, we found this to be a good change because I, I guess our most, pre, our most recent previous design before that would have had the main parachute and the drogue parachute deploying together in the, um, in the aft section. And uh, there, there were just, there could have been a lot of problems with that um, related to deploying two parachutes from the same section. It could have been tangling and all sorts of things. So this is generally just a safer configuration. The one concern is it does make our rocket fairly long. So we're, we're keeping an eye on that. Um, one other thing is because we have this separate section now, which has a separate separation point, we've added a, a new avionics bay to sort of house the equipment that'll help us accommodate that second separation event that, that will occur. So you can see there's the payload bay that we've always had in there. And now we've just added a second one at, at another separation point. So that's, that's another sort of major change that we made. Um, one other thing you'll notice is before we, we had ballast in the rocket. So that was just sort of dead weight to affect the apogee and things like that. Um, based on the changes we've made, we're actually looking at a, a pretty good altitude, actually a little bit above altitude. Um, so there's no ballast needed to sort of weigh us down. If you'll notice in the front of the nose cone coupler, um, there's in the nose cone coupler, there's still, I guess, the ballast object there to represent where we put, put ballast if we need it. But um, right now it's um, the ballast is zero. So there's not actually any weight, but if we did need it, we would put it there and we can make that adjustment easily if needed. Um, one thing to notice that the simulations are run without, um, with zero wind right now, uh, just because Open Rocket has some trouble accounting for wind and that could cause the results to come out a little bit weird. So it's likely there'll be actual wind in the actual launch and that'll bring our altitude down. So it's good that we're uh, above altitude right now, but Christian will talk again about those numbers later on. Um, in terms of other changes, um, it was really a lot of just adding in very precise masses at their precise locations. 
It's a lot of the avionics and recovery equipment, a lot of the small components and things like that, just to make it a more accurate model overall. You can go to the next slide, Joel. All right, so our current apogee based on our simulations is at about 4,600 feet. That's a little over 100 feet more than our target, but like Matt said, with wind speed taken into account, that will definitely lower it a little bit, bring it closer to our target, and that alone. And if we needed to add ballast, we can easily do it in the simulation because we kept that circle, but we just set the ballast to zero, but not so. The stability both at the real exit and the static are both also good. Uh, they're like 2.8 and it's a little bit to our overstable margin for the static stability. We want to keep it under three, but it's still good enough and we can't always have it ideal. So it's good enough and yeah, yeah we don't want like a airplane, we want a rocket. So that's why we don't want it overstable. So for our Mach number, it's around 0.5, which is well under our max Mach number. When you have the Mach numbers high, then you start getting into like supersonic region, which shock waves come up and stuff, which of course our structure of the rocket wouldn't appreciate that. Plus the flow around the rocket gets super compressible, which just makes things harder to work with and calculations harder to work with. And the velocity at the real exit is well above what we need at minimum. It's around like 70, 75 feet per second. We want it a little over 50, so that's good. We're gonna go with that. So. Any questions? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Christian. Sort of what we're doing now moving forward, um, we're starting to work on the design of the subscale rocket. So uh, for those of you who don't know the subscale, we're working on a three inch diameter, um, pretty much just a scaled version of our main full scale rockets. So our full scale is a 5.5 inch diameter and um, we're basically gonna make a three inch diameter rocket that's also scaled in its other proportions. So that basically is just a smaller version that we could launch as like a proof of concept. So we, we've started to get into the design a little bit here. Um, some of the major, so some things are easier than others to scale. So things like um, the airframe, um, those can be easy just by an airframe of a smaller diameter, you cut it down to a smaller size. But there are some things that can be more tricky and require a little bit more thought. For example, um, the motor. Um, what, one thing to take into account is the, the motor assembly pieces that are commonly sold um, are made around certain nominal sizes, so certain standard sizes. Um, you'll notice in the full scale, we're working with a 75 millimeter diameter motor. But if we were to use a 75 millimeter diameter, even if we sort of scale down the power, um, then it wouldn't really fit the three inch diameter rocket. It, it would be too tight in there. The 75 millimeters is almost three inches already. So they just don't make things that attach a 54 millimeter motor to a three inch diameter rocket. Um, so because of that, we're planning to probably scale it down to a 54 millimeter motor, which is the next smallest diameter that's um, sort of a, just a standard that's sold. And we're still evaluating our options for that, but there seem to be some pretty good ones. And we found a lot of um, components for the assembly that would perfectly match, again, a configuration with a 54 millimeter motor and a three inch diameter um, rocket itself. So one other thing about the subscale that's important to note, we're not actually gonna have a scaled down version of the payload. It's just gonna be a mass simulator for that. It's not gonna be an actually functioning payload. For the subscale flight, um, it's not necessary to demonstrate the payload. So um, basically we just scale down what we think the mass of a subscale payload would be. And then we uh, use ballast or something to basically simulate that weight in the rocket. So that when we launch it, it would be launching as if it did have a payload in it. Again, so it would just be a proof of concept that the rocket would fly, not necessarily a proof of concept for the payload. And one other challenge that we're um, sort of going to be facing with the subscale is, is the nose cone. So uh, if you remember for the full scale, we had a nose cone that had a removable coupler. Um, and that was good for us because it allowed us to have, have easy access into the nose cone. Um, you can see there's the GPS in the nose cone. If we choose to add ballast, it would be there. So um, we, we want to have access in the nose cone and the removable coupler allows us to have that access. And they make great ones for a 5.5 inch diameter rocket, but 
they don't really have them, at least on the websites that we've, we've been looking at for a three inch diameter rocket. So um, one of the challenges we're gonna be facing moving forward, and we're gonna work with like structures on this is finding the best way to, um, if, if we can't buy the right nose cone, um, maybe sort of create a configuration that would allow us to have access to um, sort of a regular nose cone with a coupler that's not removable. So that's gonna be one of the things that we have to think about moving forward with this subscale. Yeah, that's about it for what I have. Okay, so now we have um, the payload from Alex. Okay, oh, so do you mind this... if I, sorry, go ahead, I had a Bryce. question. <laughs> yeah, go for it, Bryce. Um, so why does the, the new um, avionics section not have a switch band? Is that a design choice or is that an oversight? It, this is the subscale, Joel. Could you, yeah. Um, I believe it, it does have there's a switch band on the, yeah. on here and there's not on the subscale. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. On the subscale, there definitely will be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That was an oversight. Thank you for pointing it out. And is the mass on the subscale right? Or is that just not done yet? Because the stability is like six right now. Oh yeah. No, no, none of that is done yet because we still okay. have to decide on the shoots, the shock cords and everything. So yeah, we just... still have a lot of unknowns. No worries. Just making sure. Okay, yeah. and just another thing, if you, I, I'm not sure if you guys are dead set on doing two avionics bays yet, but obviously that's going to increase the cost of your rocket drastically, and it's also going to increase your manufacturing complexity, like drastically, since the avionics bay is like one of the hardest thing to manufacture. Um, so consider looking into ways that you can prevent having to do two of them because it might make your life a lot easier and less expensive. Yeah, those are great points for sure. I know um, one of our design alternatives was pretty similar to what we did last year, which was we would have our third floating charge here and then we didn't have the middle bit, we had wiring going through. And um, I think a pretty big issue with that one was our wiring got tangled with our shock cord but like that happened for every launch last year anyways, but we are still trying to avoid having a lot of wiring going through. So I think yeah. it's, it's You might be able to route it either through the outside of the body tube, which I think would one wire outside the body tube, I think that'd be preferable to making an entire new avionics recovery section or taping it on the inside of the rocket so it can't get tangled. So you don't have it like be free where like a shock cord could hit it. You tape it down to like the side of the body tube, if that makes sense. Um, and obviously your uh, explosions of your avionics space would have to not rip that wire. So you'd have to set it up in a way where it doesn't do that. But yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so if there's no more questions, then we'll talk about the payload. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, Joel. So yeah, so there was a couple of major design changes that were made with a lot of the feedback that we got. So uh, we're actually going with some wooden discs instead of, if you remember from sheet metal from last time, and that was just to reduce the weight, uh, the weight, the safety, and the cost of the payload. Um, we're also going to be using threaded rods instead of uh, steel, uh, steel sheet metal support bars. And this basically just allows for easier assembly and disassembly. Uh, we're also shrinking the diameter from 5 inches to 4.5 inches. Uh, this is to allow a space for like the servos and the legs to work and still fit inside the rocket. But also we're constrained to either a nominal size of 5 or 4.5. So if we go from 5, we have to go all the way down to 4.5 due to the we have to buy us. We have to buy the steel hemisphere because that would be really hard to manufacture ourselves, and they only sell them in nominal sizes. We're also going to be using a VTX card instead of a XB for a video transmission, and this is basically just easier for us to do, and allows less coding for for us. And we're also going to be using a on-screen display for the GPS signal, and that's like part of the VTX system, and that is again just less programming easier to use and just allows us to see the GPS signal better. 
And if you go to the next slide, I'll sh it has the picture. So that this is what the payload looks like at the moment. So if you notice that uh, you have the rings for this um for the parachute to attach to, uh, those are the four rings up top. You have the servos down there with the legs, and then you have the camera, the antenna, and the GPS all up top, and then other components in the middle. And then you can see that these circles are made out of wood now with uh, nuts uh, connecting them all on the surface. And so if you go to the next slide, Joel. So one of the problems actually with using this threaded rod and wood setup is that the Raspberry Pi is kind of constrained to uh, fitting in between the locations of these threaded rods. And so these threaded rod locations are actually constrained by being a too close to the edge of the wood where you would be concerned about structural stability and be interfering with the uh, steel hemisphere on the bottom as there has to be good enough clearance for you to actually screw the nut into the hemisphere. And so it created a problem where with the nuts on uh, the threaded rods, the Raspberry Pi actually wouldn't fit on the plate. So you actually had to remove uh, two of the nuts to uh, actually fit the Raspberry Pi. It would actually still be supported by, this top plate would still be supported by two nuts. And if we found it would still be unstable, we could support it somewhere else along the sides with, with uh, something just to support the top plate uh, if that's found in testing, but that's hopefully not needed. And then we just added some eye bolts for the shock cord to attach to the parachute. So next slide. So this is actually the steel hemisphere for the Weeble. And this uh, is just a picture of it of showing what, is, what it's gonna be with, it's just gonna be a steel hemisphere with the four holes cut out for uh, the steel rods to go through. And then you can go to the next slide. So this is gonna let this for Christian because uh, to explain how this really works, because I think I kind of uh, skimmed over this last time. So I feel like it'd be good to explain the whole design concept. So if you wanna go ahead, Christian. All right, so basically the, if you notice there's like a bottom hemispherical shape at the bottom of the weevil, as you can see below, it's kind of giving it like the bottom of an egg shape or whatever. And the way that this is supposed to work in an ideal scenario, it's like uh, one of those weevil wobble toys from the 90s. So basically the bottom part of the payload, that bottom egg shape part is supposed to be a lot heavier than the top part of the payload. What that does is that brings the center of mass of the payload down to that bottom egg shape part. So in an ideal scenario, you're only really touching the ground on like one contact point. So if you like twist the egg or the payload like this, then it'll come out of equilibrium because of that. And then it'll want to come back to stability. So it's just going to bounce back. And that really just helps our payload stay stable, whatnot easier, just an added help. And the legs also are necessary though, because we're going to be landing on grass. So it's not going to have that perfect one point of contact that you see in the graph. So it's going to get stable, but it might be tilted a little bit afterwards. We don't know if we're really going to get within that plus or minus five degrees of freedom that we have. We honestly probably won't. So we have the Weeble to help us initially, and then we can rotate the legs to fully upright the payload once it lands. So, and the fact that we move the wood, move to wood from steel plates really brought our center of mass down before the center of mass was like kind of in the middle of the top part of the payload. And now it's a lot closer to the bottom part of the payload and that's without ballast. So our plan is to just ballast the heck out of the bottom part of the payload, probably with clay, whatnot. And that'll really help get the center of mass down to that bottom part where we needed to. So that shouldn't be a problem. Any questions?
All right. Well, thank you, Christian. I think that is all I have for the uh, payload for how it's going at the moment. So if you have any questions about what's going on, any of my design choices that I made, Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, like, putting together the payload, is this something you're going to be doing on the field? Because that seems like a lot of balancing of nut positions and whatnot uh, to no. do on the field. I was planning this on having it all assembled before. Okay. Yeah, this is just more so when we're, like, we're troubleshooting electronics, you know, it's easier to do if we need to like remove the electronic or disassemble it for some reason. And it also helps with uh, tolerances because if this was all gonna be steel and welded, well, welding doesn't have that great of tolerances. And this actually requires not tight tolerances, but greater tolerances than uh, what uh, bending uh, sheet metal and welding sheet metal would provide. Sure. Um, and are you guys going to be making a custom parachute for your four, um, connectors there because uh, the, your shroud line lengths might the, the plan was to uh connect the the shroud lines to a, a swivel and then have that connect to the parachute uh jimmy put in chat wondering if yeah. the hemisphere is the best shape for a weeble bottom i don't know if it's the best shape but it is a shape that we can buy and I mean, we're not expecting this to be a perfect Weeble. It was just supposed to uh, add a little bit of help so that it won't be, so that the servos might not have to go all the way. That's that's just the thinking on that. Just add a little bit of in, like uh, built-in stability into the system. Okay, so if that's all for payloads, it's pretty much the end of this GBM. Bryce, if you want to talk about this. <laughs> sure. Uh, okay, so on Saturday, we're going to be doing an Among Us social. Y'all already know what Among Us is. And if you don't, you run around, you murder people. It's a fun time. Um, yeah, so usually during the year, we would do socials like going out for trivia or something. But this year, since we're all cooped up in our houses, we decided we're going to be doing some Among Us. So yeah, come around 5 p.m. Saturday. It's a free game. Um, all you really need is your voice. And we're going to see if we can ruin some friendships or something. I'm not sure. We'll see what happens. It'll be fun. OK, that's the GBM. If there's any more questions, we'll stick around for like a minute or two, otherwise you're good to go. Thanks for coming. Next UBM will be in two weeks. Um, just as a small announcement, SL will be giving a mock presentation of our PBR. Um, so that would be, we'd be giving a presentation that would simulate what we would be giving to NASA.